welcome back to season two of Pax Rock Podcast. I'm your host, Audrey Marr, and I'm joined by Kylie Corman and Carlo Barone. Today we have an iOS TV football reporter and a Gen Soccer reporter, Joe Cronin, with us today. Joe, thanks for coming on. Oh, yeah, not a problem. It's Halloween. Uh, spooky seasons talked about it in a different HN podcast, the Quest for Nine, back in I think it was late September, and Platt yelled at me for mentioning <laughs> spooky season. <laughs> well, it is spooky season today. So, anyone got any costumes? <laughs> anyone have any costumes this weekend? I mean, I could say I'm like a skier right now. This is a steamboat sweatshirt, and on my jacket, there's a, there's an old lift ticket. So, I'm a skier currently. What were some this weekend? <laughs> What was, what's your, what's your oh, weekend? I dressed up as a uh, Coach Prime on uh, Friday. That was sick. I had the white cowboy hat, a little, little, little coach shirt with a little cowboy hat on the shirt, too. Nice. And just these fun sunglasses. I didn't buy it from his sunglasses store because it was 60 bucks. I just bought these, like, $10 little whatevers, but it was, mm-hmm. it was fun. No, no difference. Uh, no, yeah, <laughs> still, still, you're still Coach Prime, Carlo? basically. Um, I had three this weekend. Um, Ooh, wow. I know. And I've got a fourth one tonight. <laughs> I was going to say, is there a fourth one coming out yeah. tonight? I don't know. You, so, you get the whole wardrobe. Oh, geez. I got to think. Lifeguard? That was the first one. Yeah. Lifeguard was the first one. Had to, had to do it. Uh, it was an easy one. I already had most of the stuff anyway, so it was, it was easy. And then I did, I think it was going to end up being my best one, which kind of makes me upset because I wanted to wear my best one tonight. But I did Forrest Gump on Friday, and that actually looked really good, and I'm should have worn it tonight, and then Saturday I was Bob Knight, which was okay. Um, for the people that didn't know who that was, it was kind of hard to explain. No, you went people, out. You people, went out in Bloomington, and people didn't. know You would who that be was. surprised. You would be surprised. I was like, I'm Bob Knight. They're like, who's that? I was like, if you don't know any of basketball, uh, you're not going to get my custom. Might did as well you, did keep you carry walking. a chair around with you? I actually, <laughs> I had a little chair. I, you guys are going to laugh at me. I went to the Hobby Lobby doll section and I got a chair about this big and I put a carabiner on my belt buckle or not my belt what? buckle my belt loop on my pants and I had the chair just kind of sitting like right on my thigh that's a lead. so they'd be like oh why, why are you Bob Knight good po- points for right? me right? I kind of wish I could have seen you like in the doll section shopping for the yeah. socks. Uh, no, that's the one I got in on there really fast but I, I had the chair ready so people would be like oh what are you are you I'm like Oh, I'm Bob Knight, and then I had the chair, and I was just kind of like going like this, and they're like, oh, I got it. And, of course, I took it off and threw it a couple times. <laughs> you got to. And then tonight I'm going to be John Wick, so I got an all-black suit, black shirt, black tie, and then after this I'm going to get my face touched up with some fake blood. So. Oh, nice. You know, slick back the hair, too? You I've know, got Joe. Out. You know, Joe, that's, a, that's the part I'm considering. I don't know, because if I slick back my hair and it doesn't look, like, kind of good or, like, remotely like him— it's going to be a mess, and I'm going to have to go out anyway, and I'm just going to look like an idiot. <laughs> no, so just throw your head in the shower, rinse it off, and dry it, and you're good. Yeah, but I don't know. I had a mullet once, and my hair went back like that, and it was, like, it was very okay. I don't know. I, I, I We'll see. To we'll be see. determined. Okay. Nice. Okay, well, I was yeah. going to ask how everybody was doing, but I think we covered it there. <laughs> but we'll get started now. We have a lot to cover. Um, obviously, Indiana kept it close in State College. <laughs> Kylie was the only one out of everyone that was Shout there. Shout out Kylie for that. Shout out Kylie. Um, but yeah, lots to cover. But first, let's go over everybody's t- overall takeaways and thoughts on the game. I was very impressed. Definitely did not go into Happy Valley thinking that that was the game that I was going to witness with my own two eyes. It was a refreshing surprise, an entertaining football game for sure. Um, But I think it kind of goes along with the theme of the entire year of, well, they did this good. If they can do this against this team, then they should be able to do this against this team. And we've seen it since week one against Ohio State. We saw it against Louisville. We saw it again and again and again. So... Good flashes. I do think we're on the uh, the more good side because they have Soresby as their consistent leader, which a few of the wide receivers touched on. It was nice to know that this is it. We'll see if that is really it, but I think that was a good game to go into the final four games of the season. Yeah, this looks like a game where... <clears throat> The uh, the Hoosiers have a quarterback one for the first time all season. No more turmoil. Like... <clears throat> For the last four games of the year, they should ride with Brendan Sorsby. He looked pretty sharp. A couple of miscues here and there. The interception wasn't great, but had some good looks. That deep ball to Carter was great. I mean, right into right into the breadbasket, he took it to the distance. I, 
I don't know. I like the way that he looked in that game. Obviously, you know, he's young. He's a redshirt freshman playing against one of the best defenses in college football, on paper at least. But, yeah, I mean, it, it's a tough environment to play in front of 105,000. I think this game, too, we kind of saw how Brennan Sorsby and Rod Carey kind of started to mesh a little bit. I mean, they scored that many points against one of the best defenses they're going to play all year. And the other defense that you can even compare it to would be Ohio State, and they only scored three. I understand the quarterback situation that game versus now was completely different because they were rotating guys. They weren't even trying to win the Ohio State game, and they were try- clearly, for the most part, trying to win this game. We'll get to that later, but um, I think, uh, yeah, I think the offense meshed well and easily their best game of this season against a quality opponent on the offensive end, I would say. Mm-hmm. And you all brought brought up good points about Brendan Sorsby. Obviously, <clears throat> like he had himself a day. And this Penn State defense is one of the best in the nation. If you had to pick, like, if you had to look from looking from overall in the game, what do you think went right for Indiana on the offensive side of the ball? It looked like they had more trust in Sorsby to kind of mm-hmm. just launch it. I mean, once again, that touchdown to Dequeez Carter, he just stepped up in the pocket and let it loose. It was almost out of reach, but, I mean, it's just moments like that. You have some trust in him. He had a great read on that touchdown to Omar Cooper. He had to fit it in a tight window, and that was right after he lowered the shoulder and then it was banged up on the last few drives. And it was just moments like that where it seems like they're letting him throw it 20, 30, and obviously on the Carter when he chucked it probably 40 yards in the air. I feel like they've had more trust in him, even with, during the quarterback battle, all this back-and-forth nonsense. I feel like he they've always let him throw it, be a little bit—they were a little less cautious with him than they were with Taven. Mm-hmm. I liked how they kind of let him loose. Um, just looking at his numbers, 13 and 19, I mean, that's pretty good against Penn State defense. That I mean, their defensive line is ruining teams week in and week out. <laughs> Um, and I, I will say, I mean, it's kind of off topic, but Indiana's offensive line, for the most part, played a pretty good game, which is crazy to say because the last two seasons they have been god awful. And yeah. honestly, that game they looked like a strength. Um, he had time to throw him, like Joe mentioned. He just on that one throw to to Chris Carter that I I was shocked that I was watching. I was like, there's no way like this is actually happening right now. But you're you're right. He he stepped on the pocket and just delivered a nice ball, let him, and he he scored the touchdown. One of the longest touchdowns in Indiana history, but I, that doesn't happen without the offensive line. I think they played a great game and allowed Soresby to kind of have his coming out party as uh, the official QB1 for the re- remainder of the season. I like what you talk about with the offensive line. Like, hats off to Coach Bostad, just mm-hmm. coming in and immediately making an impact. And Josh Henderson ran for almost five yards per carry on 12 carries. That's a good game. Uh, offensively, obviously running back one, only getting under 60 yards of stuff. Once again, this Penn State defense holds teams to like 75 rush yards per game, and the Hoosiers went past that. They had 80 total yards in net yards, I think, on the day, and in, in what they gained it was over 100, though. So they were able to run the ball somewhat effectively against, once again, a very good defense. Yeah, it's kind of refreshing that we haven't had to talk about the offensive line. We talked about it a little bit at the beginning of the year, but there hasn't really been a negative reason to talk about them. And it is very impressive what Bostad has done with the offensive line, for sure. In just one year, too, which yeah. is crazy. Mm-hmm. And obviously there's there's been quarterbacks in and out, but it hasn't be- been because of injury. So and that's, a, that's, yeah. that's huge. That's a, that is very huge. And obviously three sacks, you don't want that to be consistent, but it's three sacks against a very good— I mean, they could have had— yeah. They could have had six. They, they have like six, seven, seven on a lot of teams. Yeah, I mean— A team mm-hmm. with talent. Indiana had three sacks on Penn State, if that tells yeah. you any of the yeah. numbers, so— a yeah, team with the talent gap, as much as Penn State and Indiana, they only allowed three sacks. I mean, they it's not like the offensive line is also the reason they lost the game either. No, so. well. mm-hmm. I think they, they – I mean, that was one of their best performances I've seen in a while. Oh, I mean, outside of the very last play – or not the last play of the game, but the last offensive snap that Indiana had on the safety, that was the only mm-hmm. mishap mm-hmm. when they let the blind side lose. Yeah, I feel like this was the only game that we've seen a consistent offensive scheme, both in the passing game and the running game. I mean, I don't think there's been a game that we've seen 12 carries, 57 yards from a running back. I mean, unless it was Jalen Lucas. I Maybe against wrong, Indiana but, State. Yeah, and but especially the number 10 team in the nation that has one of the best defenses in the, in the country. And then having one wide receiver plus 100 yards, almost two. I mean, this is like one of the only times that the offenses actually look like an offense, like, a offensive consistent scheme but how did you guys feel about what you saw 
let's talk about the receiver core because we're we're more used to seeing a run game in this offense this season. But how did you guys see on that end of the offense? I think that Indiana has talented receivers. I've talked about that before. Huge playmakers that I, we can talk about this later, but that I am worried for Indiana that they're going to leave because they are playmakers. But I, it's very refreshing. Jaquez Carter was an absolute weapon at Fordham and really hasn't been utilized too much this year. Donovan McCauley is a 6'5 giant target. He made his mark a little bit this weekend as well. They just have so many people... They should probably be use, utilizing Jalen Lucas a little bit more in the slot position. I think that would be very beneficial for everyone. But it's very, very refreshing. And I think if they can use that the next four games, definitely couldn't hurt them. I like Omar Cooper. I always mm-hmm. kind of had a surge. I've this been season. saying that. He's a yeah. good receiver. I saw him way back in high school. He went to Lawrence North, and I went to his rival Carmel. So I got to see him three, four times alongside Donovan McCauley, and they would just pick apart the defense in high school. Obviously, very different game from <laughs> 6 eight high school football to Big Ten football, but he's doing those same things, and that touchdown he had was great. He caught in a tight window, the quick move, the quick cutback move, and then took it to the house, and that made it a closer game in the fourth quarter at that. Mm-hmm. I know they, they had a good game, but <laughs> we talk about Donovan McCauley on that wide open touchdown. It looked like he was like jogging. I don't know if he hurt <laughs> he or something. so much space. He's, 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 he's so much five, though, compared he to like everybody else. Slow. He can probably just jog. I, I, compared I, I, to- like, he scored, like, good job, but it looked like he was like, <laughs> he looked like he had bricks on his shoes or something. Wait, I don't know. He covers, he covers like five slow. yards per step. That's true. He is really tall. <laughs> the source dude, I but. said yesterday, someone <laughs> asked him, like, what was going through your mind during that play, and he was like, can he run any faster? <laughs> <laughs> so I mean, it was that was a universal feeling. Yeah. <laughs> as much as Donovan took that to the house, that's a heads up play from from Soresby because mm-hmm. he saw the corner come right away and he was his first read just to dump it to him and he took it to the house. I, I mean that play, that and the um to Keith Carter touchdown. After once they got the Donovan McCoy touchdown, I was like, okay, they're actually they came to play today. Yeah, because sure. Indiana's been scoring right away in the first yep. quarter, first half, and that's not a huge surprise. But when <clears throat> McCauley scored, that's when I was like, oh, this this might be a little bit of a battle here. Mm-hmm. But, yeah, going back to the McCauley touchdown, Rod Carey. Now, this is a direct quote. <laughs> there, there will never and was never a more open wide receiver in the history of football, so <laughs> you better make that play. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think the only thing that you could noticeably say that really went wrong at one point in the game was within the special teams, obviously the month muffed punt, and that was an issue with the Rutgers game that Jalen Lucas did, but then they decided to put Camden Jordan at the start of the game. First off on that end, what did you guys think about that decision taking Jalen off of that starting punt return role? I mean, Jalen's just struggled in the special teams this year, and I think that's something that all of us have pretty much noticed. And Cam Jordan just didn't look ready, looked a little nervous. The nerves got to him, but wow. The the shooting yourself in the foot has been such a trend. It's an every week thing. Year. Every week. I mean, the, against the, team. the difference of the momentum against Rutgers uh, two weeks ago, and then obviously that, it was a tie game, and then Penn State's able to go up 17-14 heading into the break. So once again, the defense is back on the field after holding the, the Nittany Lions to another punt. Yeah, I, I'm not surprised, and I understand you have to. I mean, at the scrimmage game earlier this season, I don't think, were any of you guys here? It was over the summer, so I don't think so. But <laughs> Scratching your head like that. But he was muffing punts then. This is not a surprise entirely, so I can understand trying to see what works. If you're going to have a muff punt regardless, might as well switch it up a little bit. But... Yeah, I don't. I don't think it was the wrong move. Hindsight, it is what it is. Would Jalen Lucas have catched that? Who knows? He muffed one last week. He's muffed them before. I think he's just got to play around there still. But at this point in the season, there's not much room to play around on any side of the field. I mean, that's two weeks in a row that they've allowed a punt. Yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me. That's two weeks in a row they've muffed a punt, and it's resulted right into a touchdown. So, um, well, I guess last week was a field goal, but you get what I'm saying. They just scoring, scoring points from the opponent that they wouldn't have gotten otherwise if they didn't muff the punt. Whether I think it would be Jordan again or they'll throw Lucas back there, I don't think so. 
Um, I'd be interested to see if they have a third option. But, I mean, then again, if you're going down to a third person returning kicks in the same season, that's that's a problem. So I think consistency is what they need. But I think uh, the only way, really way to fix this is just it's just more reps. And it's just it's practicing it. And honestly, you can compare this to the quarterback situation as they need – Someone, they're like, hey, you're going to catch this ball, and you're not going to drop it. Have you ever thought about just rushing 11, no returner? Every every no. every punt, just rush 11. Just let the punt happen. And it's just like, if okay. you're pinned on the one, you're pinned on the one. Like, yeah, we'll Situationally, try and get the block. Situationally, I could see how that could work. <laughs> I, I like your thinking. That's, that's something you guys try and Madden a few times, and then you <laughs> do it. <laughs> if it works a few times, I mean... <sighs> See, I've never so I've never seen someone try that either. I mean, they, you put put some pressure on a college punter and see what they can do. And also, they'll have two <laughs> they'll have two I, gunners on the outside and the punter, so they'll be down two or three people anyway, unless they move the guys in. I mean, regardless, if they had all eleven right there, and then Indiana has all eleven, they're still gonna have one more guy because the punter can't block. Yeah. So. It, it's honestly not that. It calls crazy. House. Joey, you might be honest something. Honestly. Put me special teams coordinator me, for a game. Let me do some quick research. <laughs> Look, I, it, it's not going to be a 100% thing. You're going to get your, your situations where you're pinned with, in the 10 because of some punters are just that guy. Like, you got your Pat McAfee's of the world, even though he's retired. But In college? I'm just, That's what I'm saying. Put the pressure. <laughs> college kickers and punters are the biggest anomaly I've ever seen in college sports because they are so inconsistent, and especially the kickers. Th- They're missing 35 yards. Th- think about college punters too like the nfl you get it and you kind of just kick it college they they, they, might they, they go out to their yeah. side they like on their dominant leg you get you get a guy or two like you plan that out you scout them like hey he's gonna run to the right three yards overload you that overload that, that side. side oh my gosh it's you could deck them you can you can deck them with the ball you i mean imagine kick. like being able to flat line a punter we're not yeah. flat line flatten a punter hey <laughs> 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 oh, oh that, that's <laughs> Um, I my research concluded that's not been done before. I mean, I'm sure it has at some high school. Call it the Rush Eleven. You heard it here first. <laughs> J- Joe's a, Joe's a, the next special teams coordinator for IU <laughs> or Carmel. But there there was a point where very well into the game that all of Penn State's points had been the result of an IU mistake, whether that be a bad snap on the fourth and seven or yeah the muff punt. I'm forgetting the other ones, but <laughs> I think the I saw interception. the interception. I think I saw at the end of the game that Penn State, in total on the season, has 72 points off of turnovers. Oh Lord! Which, Jesus. like, obviously 12. I think was Indiana. So obviously, a lot of mistakes within the special teams. But to your point on what they're going to do if they're adding a third guy, I think they will test a third guy. But I think. To your point in consistency, I think they're going to go with Jalen Lucas. I think they're going to stick with him. Obviously, they had the most luck with him and the most consistency of him. And I think after putting Camden Jordan in for one game and having Jalen Lucas in for every other one and having the muff punt in one game, I think they're going to go with him. But obviously, with all those other mistakes within Rutgers and within Penn State, what do you guys think special teams needs to do to turn things around heading into the rest of the season? Because they need to win out if they want to make a bowl game. So special teams is going to be a big part of this. Catch punts. Rush 11. The rush 11. <laughs> rush 11 is the great answer. <laughs> I'm trademarking that. We'll, we'll see. Can we get stickers made? I feel like that'd be, that'd, be <laughs> that'd be a good Rush 11. Good shirts. That'd be a good podcast, dude. Rush yeah. 11. Rush 11. Right. Rush 11. Right. Um, Audrey, to answer your question, what they need to do, that, that, I mean, it's just, it's coaching at that point. I mean, we saw it last week, un- unblocked defender. That's just a mental error from the coaches. That's not even on, I mean, it's on the players, but it's more on the coaching staff. I just think it's, it's just more cleaning things up. And you can say that about a lot of things with this team, just cleaning things up. I will say their special teams is very reflective of kind of the program as a whole. Where it's like, you know, last year was a strength. Now it's not. Offensive line was bad bad last year. Now it's not. It's like picking and choosing what area you're really going to focus on and what area you're going to be like, oh, we got that fine. We figured that out last year. And now we see that kind of start to bite them in the butt. It's it's really just coaching. Um, and the, the muff punts, I mean, that's un, it, that, that's inexcusable. I mean, that's a big reason. I mean, they allowed, what, seven points? So based on that alone, they ended up losing the game. I mean, they lost by nine, but that was because of the whole uh, strip sack in the end with the safety. But, I mean, that touchdown they get back, it's a tie game. 
and that's a very different game. And the the strip sack probably doesn't happen. And Indiana might walk out victorious. That's a lot of things I'm pulling together there. But seven points is seven points. And in a Big Ten game, seven points means a lot more than it does in an SEC game. So I mm-hmm. think it's really just they need to clean it up coaching-wise, um, whether that be getting a new special team coordinator or not, changing up guys. But they need to do something differently. Well, Chris Freeman also missed uh, a 37-yarder at the end of the third quarter, which I think at the oh, time right. would have tied it or would have made it uh, 24-17. I'm not exactly sure. But to your point, it, it comes down to repetitions. Every time we've talked to either Rod Carey or even before with Walt Bell, with Tom Allen, they when they talk about the offensive line, they talk about repetitions, and they are the hardest working, and they've done the most reps. And you've seen the results. They've gotten significantly better this season. Look at the special teams. Obviously, we're not at the practices, so we're not entirely sure of how much they practice, but what the result in game time doesn't look like they are getting enough practice at kick returning or punt returning, and then some of the, you know, you're moving around the formation on a on a punt, and then there's a, a gaping hole for a Rutgers player to block him for a touchdown. Mm-hmm. Well, obviously, despite the special teams, this was a game that had a lot of highlights on both sides of the ball. If you guys had to pick both offensive and defensive MVP, who would you go for? Offensive, I'm saying Brendan Soresby. I think he just really did a great job. And if if the team is consistent, if they <laughs> stick with this guy. I've heard this one before. <laughs> I think they might. we can talk about what the rest of the season is going to look like later. But I could... They might be able to have a few wins. If this is what one, two weeks of practice, this is your QB1 looks like, by the end of the season, get six weeks with one guy as your head guy? Maybe. Maybe. But he he played really well. He took some hits and took it like a champ, got right up. I think he did pretty good. So I'm going to mm-hmm. say him. Are we picking defense, too? Yes. <laughs> I don't even really know. Actually, come back to me on defense. Okay. Right, I'm, I'm agreeing with Kylie, with Brendan Soresby. Obviously, Indiana lost, but he played like a winner. Like, he mm-hmm. played like he wanted that position that he was in, that he earned it, and he was making good throws. And he yeah, seems he's very confident. Yeah, and that's what you need. I mean, you're go- he shook off that bad interception and had some great throws in the second half. He shook off, it was early in the first quarter, he overthrew McCauley on an out route that would have been the first first down of the game, and they went three and out, but, you know, he improved from that moment and even that final touchdown he had it was right after he took that huge hit on the shoulder and was like grimacing in pain for the rest of the game so i i think it's a very clear that he's the offensive mvp of the game and performances like that is how you build a team yes they're two and six oh and five of the big ten but look ahead at the last wah. four games <laughs> yeah, do four. we get the sound effects working did you just say <laughs> wop wop <laughs> <laughs> for my MVP, I it's unoriginal, but Sorsby, I mean, he looked he looked like he looked like QB one. And he looked like he was composed. You guys kind of mentioned it already, but he had so many plays that you could tell that he was ready for the moment. Um and for, he knows that, you know, Indiana's not the best team out there, but they're going against Penn State and for them to win, he's gonna have to play like they're the better team. And he honestly, I would say he outplayed Penn State's quarterback, to be honest, um, based off of you know the defense they're playing, the players mm-hmm. they have, he 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 played great. And on a, and for, for defensive MVP, I'm gonna have to go with Josh Sanguinetti. Shout out, bro! He's in one of my classes. <laughs> uh, he got the interception. Does he um, watch this podcast? Definitely not. <laughs> but he's in one of my classes, so shout out him. But I would say he's the MVP. I mean, he got uh, Drew Aller's first inter. Career mm-hmm. interception, which I believe was the longest streak in college football to start a career ever. It was like 301 pass attempts. Someone have to double check me on that, but he had a record that Sanguinetti basically ended with that pick. I mean, that pick set up set up Indiana to win or eventually tie the game, but they had a chance to win. Um, whether that interception be the result of pressure, which they were getting on him all day, um, then again, he is the one that made the catch and. In a, in a big moment like that, you know your team is probably, I mean, they lose the game. They're in a really tough spot to get to, to bowl eligibility. At the time, they were tied. To get that interception and just hold on to it is not as easy as probably people think. A lot of pressure um, is put on him. But he got the, the biggest turnover of the game that ended up being the reason that Indiana had a chance to win this game. And if you guys remember, Penn State, 
has has beaten IU every single time they've ever played except for twice. I was going to say they're, <laughs> they've won twice. And both times were in Bloomington. They almost pulled off something that no IU team's ever done, whether that means very much at all. Probably doesn't. Did you see the graphic that they were throwing, that CBS was throwing up in the fourth quarter when it was tied 24-24? It was like yes, I over know 30 about. years ago since IU had beat a top 10 team on the road. It was all oh, these things about wow. I mean, that, the that, scenario. <laughs> they win that game. That's one of the biggest wins of program history. No Easy. question. Which is weird mm-hmm. to say because it's just a random Saturday. That would Saturday. have been insane. Oh, yeah. I don't think I think I would have been in shock. I was already a little bit in shock during that game, kind of like, what's going on here? But oh my gosh, if they would have pulled that off, <laughs> would have been stunned. My defensive MVP, we got sidetracked, Nick Toomer. <laughs> He had a sack as a corner. That's tough to do. He had two tackles for loss and a pass breakup. He was all over the field. And, I mean, once again, Drew Allard didn't have a great game outside the deep touchdown, which gave Penn State uh, the eventual win. Tumor wasn't targeted, and he wasn't targeted on that touchdown either. I just think he, he played solid. Well, you took my defensive MVP. I was going to go with Nick Tumor as well. But I could any game I could go with Aaron Casey, 10 total tackles, 7 solo, 0.5 sacks and um, 1.5 tackles for loss. I mean, it's just any game he will show up and he will be the best defensive guy on the field, and there's just no question in it. And then for offensive, of course, I was going to go with Soresby as well. He was obviously the best statistically on the field, but I think I'm going to go with Dakeese Carter only because he had three receptions, but obviously plus 100 yards, but he was showing, like, obviously what he did at Fordham and no one's really seen that from him yet this year and I think that if this is if McCauley Cooper and Carter are Soresby's three primary receivers and they all play like they did on Penn State I think the winning for winning out for the rest of the season is very possible and let's not forget Indiana's schedule from now on is Besides Wisconsin, they, I mean, those three teams, Michigan State, Illinois, and Purdue, yeah. are just as bad as IU is. Obviously, we're going to get a little bit into Wisconsin, but I don't think that's a. <clears throat> Winning out. Yeah. Getting four wins, considering they only have two right now, which they would double their amount of wins. That's, it sounds weird on paper. It's like, okay, they have only have two wins and it's, it's November now. Like, there's no way they make a bowl game, but their schedule is. I mean, for being the Big Ten East, they lined up really well for them to to get a bowl game. I think the hardest game is this weekend, but mm-hmm. I will say Tom Allen has. We'll talk about this later, but Tom Allen has definitely played Luke Fickle well um, in the past. So you play like that against Penn State, you bring that to Bloomington. Usually, they're a better home team anyway. It could get. It definitely could get very interesting. Mm-hmm. Respectfully, um, <laughs> let me let me pull this up we from last year. Pulling up there. Respectfully, here. I'm going to call Cap. Um, <laughs> Please. From the first season of IU Cincy, two years ago, was a very good game, and that was a game that Indiana might have been able to win if Michael McFadden. You talking about 2021? I'm. You said that Tom Allen plays Luke Fickle well. Last season, Cincinnati beat IU 45 to 24. And it, it was not. It was, it was it like was, it was over in the first half. It was honestly. over in the first quarter when. Uh, but let, let me Trey ask you. Tucker, let me Tyler ask Scott, you. Scott, one of the is, two. Is that team better than this one? No. Is the 2021 team better than this one? I would say no as well. And if you remember in 2021, before Mike McFadden gets injured or not injured, tar- gets taken out of the game, that game was neck and neck, and that game was also on the face of the sun too. But um, I do remember that game. Oh my god, I was summer for like three weeks. But regardless, <laughs> I'm just saying I it, you have I, you have two sample sizes and one is an absolute like, blowout. But also, if you look at the second half of that game, they played a lot better. It's the it's the second half. They scored two touchdowns. Ooh well. I mean, it didn't <laughs> respectfully it, like. Yeah, but you were you, down you thirty five out of four. They played pretty bad. I think that's all right, especially with the talent IU has, considering Cincinnati was in the playoff. But that no last year that last season was after they. Pretty much cleared house of their playoff team. I, I know, but still, Cincinnati's a decent program, or I guess they were before they lost him. Like they were, they were solid last year. But I'm just saying, like, mm. mm-hmm. I don't well, know. we can get more into the Wisconsin talk in a second. But to close this out on the Penn State discussion, do you guys think that this game was the turning point for Indiana, and has everything finally clicked? I think it could be. 
I was gonna say I would love to say yes. Yeah. But I again, like I said earlier, that we've just had so many of these moments <laughs> so far this season. Like, what if so many what if moments? What if they played like they did that first quarter of Michigan? What if they beat Ohio State that first game? What if they beat Louisville? All these what ifs and nothing ever comes to fruition. So I think this one is very on the line. Just seeing the attitude like yesterday at Monday pressers of the players that is the most cheerful, the best mood that any of them, the coaches, players, have been in on a Monday presser. So we can read into that a little bit. I'm hoping that they take this energy, this attitude, that they were neck and neck with a number 10 team, which Penn State's Penn State, that's a good team. It is not a top 10 team. They have struggled the past few weeks. I don't I don't think they're anything super special. I mean, probably still ranked, but... I don't think that they were anything crazy to IU. I mean, obviously, Michigan and Ohio State were more challenging, I would say. Well, Michigan's Michigan bad knew <laughs> Michigan knew they were calling everything but the trick play. That situation just keeps getting <laughs> It's so funny. Did you see deeper, the thing with, uh, it was Central Michigan, Michigan State? Yeah. Oh, yeah. He's there cheering on the sidelines. Like, that, how? That, that situation just gets... <sighs> It's just crazy. they open up a can of worms and they did not realize how deep it's going. It's when crazy. that thing is done, probably in like maybe January after the season, February, this can be some big sanctions against Michigan. I wouldn't be surprised if they're banned from the playoff for a year or two. Well, didn't they um take out their well, they didn't take it out, but like the contract for Jim Harbaugh, the contract extension they removed. So I don't know. That could be interesting to see. Well, I just don't under Let's look at their schedule because that's a good that's a good Michigan team regardless. Mm-hmm. That's crazy. Regardless. That's, regardless. that's so crazy that you're sign stealing when it's this like the state of what Michigan state is. So right their now. first game was against East Carolina. Tough matchup. Then <laughs> University of Las Vegas. Oh. Then Bowling Green. <laughs> then Rutgers. Hey, that's Connor Basilak. Don't disrespect. I'm not hearing any teams <laughs> oh, that we need to steal signs for. Nebraska. Minnesota. At Nebraska, that oh, 45-7 at Nebraska. That's a good win. Nebraska shows out. They do. Nebraska's been solid this year. They're five and three. Yeah, but you know, they have their signs and all. Minnesota, <laughs> Indiana, Oof. Michigan State. This schedule's really, need, really do you easy. Really, really need to steal signs from any of these teams? Mm-mm. I, 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 the question <laughs> is, the question is, do you think that even without the sign stealing? That they're better than Georgia, that they're number one. Because I know we were saying yes. in a podcast that they're number one. They're so good. I think they're good. I think regardless. They, yes. That yeah. offensive line, the defensive line, the corners, the running backs, the receivers, even JJ McCarthy looks good. And that's they, that hurts me to say because mm-hmm. like he's like he's such a system guy. He looks like Stetson Bennett, but he looks better. They've got <laughs> they've got everything you need. You've got they've got good defense, got good receivers. They have a, I mean, running back that's just as good as their quarterback. Both you could argue in not and now probably not the Heisman running, but I mean preseason they're both in in at least their names are in the pool. They've got everything you need. You've got experienced coach, good program. And that athletic department, which is crazy to say, that actually cares about the team, not going to throw anyone under the bus, but they invest money into them, and you see what happens. They have also had a century of this, though, of culture of football. There Mm -hmm. is a... Yeah. When you hypothetically don't throw shade, there is a culture that comes with football that's built. Yeah. And it's I like... You get rare examples of a TCU or Cincy coming out of nowhere and being good at football. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, Wisconsin talk. (laughs) Um, Well, okay. So we're going to move on to the Wisconsin discussion, but stay tuned for later this week because we're not going to do a big preview of Wisconsin. There's going to be another episode where they go into a deeper dive into the Wisconsin game. But for now, let's give a couple of predictions. First off, Monday Presser or some somewhere. Coach Allen said that Luke Fickle... Um, has a completely different offensive scheme with Wisconsin than what they've seen in the past with with, with Wisconsin. Does the defense handle this offense? Can they? Yes. Yes. Uh, the reason is is because Wisconsin has been a ground-pound team since the dawn of time. There have been big running back names it, really in the 2010s, even before that. Melvin Gordon's one, Monty Ball, Jonathan Taylor, you name it. It goes on. It goes on. Braylon Allen is one of those guys. Obviously, he's hurt. That's 
a terrible to see he's had a is great he's season. Is still questionable right now? I, I was looking at stuff. He's still, like, there's not I really good That's a report. big, that's, that's a, a huge, big, that's a huge big player. Loss. Luke Fickle comes in, and what does he do? He brings in the offensive coordinator from UNC, a team that passes the ball like nobody's business. They run an air raid style offense at a team that runs the ball a ton. For an air raid, you're going four, even five guys out. You're spreading wide and up the field with very athletic big receivers that Wisconsin doesn't have. Right now, they're top two receivers because they have another receiver that is injured. That's injured. It's uh, Shamari Dyke. He injured his leg against uh, in their last game against Ohio State. Will Pauling and Bryson Green. Bryson Green six foot. Will Pauling is five ten. Those are your top two receivers that you have heading into Indiana. And this is an Indiana team that has defended the pass pretty solid. Like, they've not done a bad job against defending the pass. I would definitely be more concerned about the run game, especially, like, when, when they get a quarterback they can that can run, they don't know what to do. So if Braylon Allen does play, that's I think not I ideal think it's questionable for, because it was, like, fourth quarter— Against Ohio State in a close game, and he was on the sideline in street clothes. I, I did so. just look it up, and it said he had a high ankle sprain. He didn't practice Sunday, mm. and he's questionable. That's tough. For Even if he weekend. plays, though, he's not going to be as effective. He's, he's not no. yeah. Yeah. High, high ankle sprain yeah. is tough. You got to plant. You I mean, this is already— cut. This is— that, If um, Braylon Allen doesn't play, that's their top two running backs that are out, because earlier in the year, his name's Ches Malusi. He— Broke his fibia against Purdue. Jesus. Yeah. Jeez. Oh, I, I, was, I was watching their highlight. I was like, ooh, that's a, it, was, it was gross. Poor guy. So we got Jackson Acker, who's going to be stepping up to the plate. Hasn't had a ton of playing time. And then also no Tanner Mordecai. This team has... There's something about Wisconsin teams this year that have been extremely injury-prone. Right, mm. Carlo? <laughs> Are we <laughs> getting into that? Football Are teams in that? Wisconsin that get hurt a lot. <laughs> Are yeah, we getting into I, that? I, know. That, that? I mean, even week one. <laughs> after the bye week, they had 10 guys... All right, I'll stop after the Packers talking for this. But after the bye <laughs> week, you have 10 people on the injury report? Come on. The page was full. It was a like full, oh my. full page. Uh, and they had all the Raiders, best players. Packers, and just Jair Alexander. Oh my gosh. Jair Alexander, Aaron Jones, ooh, Christian ooh. Watson. Just, uh, everybody. Everybody. I, uh, speaking on Wisconsin, now just looking at their last three games, I mean, they're one and two. And their only win is a four-point win against Illinois, who is... Probably just as bad as IU is. So it's not like Wisconsin is playing great football as of late either, considering they lost to Iowa 15 to 6. I understand Iowa's oh defense is good, but like six points at home, uh, it, I'm pretty sure that's a rivalry game. That's, that's, that's rough. I mean, 25 against Illinois. Indiana, I mean, they scored 24 against Penn State. If they're scoring that, I mean, they can definitely put that on Wisconsin. They only scored 10 against Ohio State, which is you know, seven points better than IU is. But I would say if IU played Ohio State right now, they definitely score more than three points. So. I mean, this, is a, this is a solid Wisconsin defense, and that's another thing. They've always had good defenses in the Big Ten. Obviously, they're the Big Ten West, so you Only can, good Wisconsin defense in you state. Can, you can... T- <laughs> I'm sorry. I was going to you said, you said you're, you're done. done. I'm not. You're done. I'm so <laughs> fed up. I'm so fed up. Nev- you can never be done when it comes to Oh, my gosh. Backwards. I can talk about this for an hour. <laughs> I mean, ask it odd, but you, wanna, you guys want to talk about my ca- or not my, but <laughs> Matt Canada? <laughs> yes. <laughs> because we Irrelevant. can talk about that. <laughs> NFL park coming soon. NFL. <laughs> okay. Joe Brennan has one. Does In the it? trenches. Oh wow! Hmm? Okay. I just gave him a shout out. Going, <laughs> going back to the if Braylon Allen plays, maybe he does, maybe he doesn't. Wisconsin is five and three. They're needing one game to be bowl eligible. Indiana's been they in have, a situation before. They have Indiana, Northwestern, Nebraska, and Minnesota. If I want my star player back to pretend like to be in a bowl to get that game winning, I'm not putting him in against Indiana. It's no. Indiana. Mm-hmm. You've got Northwestern. Probably win that. Nebraska might Northwestern just beat Maryland. Yeah, they, yeah, they, yeah, they Maryland. Okay, I was talking about this earlier. The transitive property does not work in the Big Ten. I love it's how just, dysfunctional the Big Ten has been. It's crazy. And Maryland was looking so good in those first five weeks. Right, just, what happened? Five and oh. What there's, happened? There's Gone. the Indiana Ohio State, the Indiana Akron, the Indiana Penn State, the Penn State Ohio State, like the Maryland Indiana Maryland Northwestern. Shh, it just doesn't make sense. Watch Penn mm. State just like win by like three touchdowns against Michigan. I think that's in two weeks. That would that break would be, that would break the conference. <laughs> that would be it's not gonna happen. It's not gonna I, I saw something on Twitter that said like the top are like the lowest scoring offenses in FBS 
Out of the eight, eight of the ten, eight, eight of the ten, ten were Big Ten. Six and of them were Big Ten West. Michigan State was the dead last. Then you got IU like point six or something ahead of them. Nice at eighteen something a game, and you just go up. It's Iowa, Illinois. You just it's it's rough. Now this was for Power Five conferences, though. It wasn't for oh, FBS. Then yeah, but still, correction, but that's still, it's crazy. I don't I don't know the exact math, but we got 14, 14, 12, 14, and let's see a caramel education. Fourteen. I can count. I just count. Like I just put the numbers on my finger. I don't know. It's it's upwards of like seventy something teams, and eight of the top uh, top ten worst offenses are in the Big Ten. Yeah, it's it's, it's atrocious, and that's why I. Cannot wait to watch big, not watch Big Ten football Some, after this year. <laughs> as it, it, intently it, as I am, the, the Big Ten, Big Ten football like epitomizes Midwest football. Yes, just like yes. gross, like it's yes. not good. The weather is bad. <laughs> the weather, bad it's weather. Just, uh, you, you got these like six five. One winter game is eighty. The next, it's snowy in twenty. <laughs> oh, yep. God. Think about this. Dude. You got the when, Iowa uh, spread at under thirty somehow. Th- think about like a. UCLA at like Rutgers in like November. <laughs> They're gonna get eaten alive by that cold. They, they ain't ever seen under seventy. Oh, <laughs> those those the Southern California boys, yeah, like that's the time difference is gonna be Minnesota. 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 Oh, Minnesota. 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 Is the final score? <sighs> Big Ten basketball. Big it's Ten just, basketball. It's Big Ten football. Midwest the sports. Thing. They're the same thing. They're just gritty. Man. They're hard. They just they toughen you up. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> you kind of. <laughs> you know, like. Oh. Uh, that, that was wild. wild. That was like. Uh, that was wild. I was like, I know it's getting clipped for this. That Shrek comes out. That makes my job easy. You ever watched Shrek before? Sorry. You ever watched Shrek when the kids like? Yeah, there are. I ain't gonna do it. Do the roar. Do it. <laughs> no, I do it. <laughs> you just did do the roar. <laughs> or is that are, a are we, are we good? Or like a like no. grizzly bear? <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. What can I do? Stop. Because I just I was I seen it on the little computer and you're. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, what was I doing? No. <laughs> okay. okay, are we good? I yeah, so. I've been good. I've been good. Okay, okay. So, uh, can you be that that kid tonight for Halloween? <laughs> the do the roar kid. Yeah. You, you need know, a bowl yeah. cut, just like. <laughs> yeah, you don't even have to worry about slicking back the hair. Oh, I'm so worried. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Are you even listening to this conversation? I don't think so. Okay, so we know that there has been a bit of an attendance issue at Memorial Stadium. What? (laughs) Okay, but obviously this was a game that I feel like got a lot of Indiana fans really excited. The exception that, well, no exception. It is a noon game on a Saturday. Got a cold front coming through. It's actually freezing today. Following Um, following a Halloween weekend. Shout out, Cody. (laughs) Shout out, Cody. Um, anyway, how full do you guys think Memorial Stadium will be? It's gonna be this, this Saturday. Full. It's probably gonna be that full. <laughs> Agreed. It's probably gonna be its average, not that great. But also, we've been talking about Indiana doesn't play well on the road. Well, they don't. Quite frankly, they don't really play that well at home either. Sometimes I think they might play better on the road, as we saw this weekend. I don't think that they would have done that to Penn State at home. Well, theoretically, though. They're never playing with a full. Mem- they haven't played with a full Memorial Stadium or a full student section at home yet. So I think like it's not going to be full. This imagine week. if not, fans were allowed in 2020 when Penix and the little will die. Dude, they would have stormed the field. It would have been one of the best moments in college. I didn't cover the team. I was fully a fan at that point. It would have been one of the best moments in college, and we were just robbed of it because of the pandemic. So mm. not fun. <clears throat> <laughs> I always wonder Tell me how you really feel <laughs> on like the marketing clips and like the hype videos and they have a f- like even the pictures at the stadium they have a full memorial stadium and I'm just like what did you are you, are you sure about that? When was that? Are you sure about that? <laughs> Wait, why are there uh, three fans out of the same in different rows? <laughs> 
I just, I just really wonder, like, did we get a little creative here? Because I will say, I mean, the creative team pretty good. It's creative made for cloud. some hilarious moments, like against Akron when it went to overtime and they switched the field and you got like the the probably like a hundred or two hundred remaining students and they had to run across the the bleachers to the other side. That was funny. That, that was, was really, so funny. The shirtless student section, which we really haven't seen much of this year. This could be a game. I feel like this could I be a game. Right. We see it come out. I think you're right. I think this it's may cold. be it. Exactly. We've seen oh. a few. That's what they I guess I've, we've seen yeah. a few little kids try to like bring back the tradition, like three. but <laughs> it's never really stuck. So I think I think that's something we can look for in the mm-hmm. coming games. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> Only two more at Memorial Stadium. So that's crazy. And the thing crazy. about the the Michigan State game is that's right when. Thanksgiving break starts. Like that's the yeah. Everyone's going home. Everyone's going yeah, home. no one's gonna yeah, be at no the Michigan gonna be State there. Game. So actually, I feel like people might actually be at this one. This is this for is a lot of this people. Is the last this game. is their last chance. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah. And, yeah. Oof. Oh, and if you me. and if you watch <laughs> old, uh, hey, why just flash to us? If you watched if young, the. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Okay. <laughs> if fans watch the Penn State Indiana game, they're like, wow. That's, That's the number saying. 10 team in the country. That's what I'm saying. Might as well go and... I saw a little too many that or so breakfast club. tweets. So, oh. Well, tailgate fields, too. Usually, I feel like it goes breakfast club, you kind of stumble over to the fields, and then you go either into the game or you go... Home. You fall asleep <laughs> at you fall asleep <laughs> at gate five. We <laughs> fall asleep in the tailgate fields. Should we go through and talk about... If they're gonna win these, what games are gonna win out of these last four? Or no? We can, yeah. we can quickly do we it. Can. A quick Get little. the brooms. Get the yeah. Really? I really? No. Okay. Well, I think it's possible. No, why not it be bold? It's fun. I be bold. really it's think possible. that this is a good two and six team. Like best two and six <laughs> team in the country. Like, no, it is. I think it is because I mean, who would have thought that it was a thirty point spread at Penn State? nine point loss i mean i don't know i think that there is a chance i really do think that they can do it i think that when it comes to indiana football quite literally anything's possible except you know like super huge accomplishment but because they're just so unpredictable but when you use that unpredictability you can then predict that nothing's gonna ever happen it that's exactly what i was saying they're not any two and ten though Mm-mm. No, no. I think no. they get at least one win. But I think winning one. winning four games in a row. That's four consistent performances in a row without messing up. And then go bowling. But, but going back I'll to that. I'll book my plane ticket now. Going back to that um, did everything click question. I think that obviously the defense has been fairly consistent, I feel like, throughout the season. It was really just the offense and now the special teams, too. I think that obviously Rod Carey, like they needed a couple weeks. I don't think I think they were using the same plays that they had and they were just seeing what works. That's what they've all been saying. And I think that they found what works. I think that they found the people that it works with. And I think we'll see it definitely more this week. But to see that against the number 10 team in the nation, I think is crazy. I will say, I think I mean, you have to think about how hard these dudes are working. Just because they're two and six doesn't mean that they're not hitting the weight room, hitting practice every single day, and that's tough to keep on doing and trying your best when it's not going your way. I think the only thing that's really keeping most of this locker room together, and this is all speculation, obviously we're not in the locker room, but I think the idea that they still could potentially go to a bowl is that's their motivating factor right now. So if things don't go well this weekend— I would not be surprised if a lot of people just say, I mean, obviously they're still going to show up, but why risk getting hurt? Why risk trying for what? Especially Mm -hmm. guys that can transfer to. Guys that can transfer, seniors that whatever, they've had their fun. I don't want to get hurt for the rest of my life. I want to start training for getting ready for the draft process, whatever that may be. So I think this game is actually, might actually, I mean, again, like I said, this is all speculation, but definitely a point to think about. Mm-hmm. Like what, like you said, I think if they come out flat against Wisconsin, they just get blown out. I think they're going to make the last three games a little bit hard on themselves. But this weekend is huge. Motivation is a big thing, as you mentioned. I think they have the t- – I, I don't want to say the talent. I think they can win the last three games, and I think they'll be close. 
But this Wisconsin one is the only one I could see that like it could get real messy real fast. But if it doesn't, if if they're in it to the end too, that will just break their hearts, especially if they lose because at home. I mean, you you see that you got the Penn State game, you just narrowly lost, and I, we mentioned it about two months ago, a month ago. That Louisville game it could come to bite them in the butt, especially if they are one short. Let's let's just say they lose to Wisconsin and they win the last three. They'll end five and seven, which would be crazy because they'll have three Big Ten wins, which will be more in the last two seasons. But then you've got Louisville, who's 15 right now, and you lose by one touchdown in Lucas Oil Stadium. I mean, that that game would bite them in the butt a lot. And I think I think this weekend I think this weekend's huge. And mm-hmm. honestly, this weekend will determine I mean, it will determine their season because if they lose, then they're they're done essentially. But it it'll determine a lot more about the locker room and motivation going forward. And even keeping guys, because once you're out of bowl eligibility, the only thing you can do is just play the rest of your games and try to, you know, hold your your good players together. You don't want Jalen Lucas transferring. You don't want Taven or even Sorsby getting out of there. Like, to keep the locker room and the culture together, you need to win some games. And the minute you're bowl el- and ineligible, that becomes a lot harder to, to convince them, hey, come back next year. You see how we've played the last three weeks. Um, we can do something. And I feel like the last couple of years, I mean, that Michigan State win last year, I think, kind of helped retain some of those players and give some hope to the program. Um, and obviously, they haven't shown it for most of this year, but retaining the locker room and the players and the culture you have, even if they don't win, is so important. And I think Tom Allen will test out a lot of new players, guys that aren't getting a ton of playing time, if they end up losing this game to Wisconsin. Bottom line, this this weekend's huge. And mm-hmm. if they lose, yeah. it's a lot bigger than just being bowl, bowl ineligible. Now, say they <clears throat> end the season 5-7, and seven, whatever combination you want to make it, a win against Wisconsin and the two of the last three. Is that an unsuccessful year from the previous two? Because it's an improved record from like, both other seasons. It, Obviously, it's I, not success. I would not say it's a successful season because a successful season is – Going being bowl eligible and beyond, but is that a step in the right direction? If they lose, say they lose to Wisconsin, and you know, out of some miracle, maybe they put it together for the final three games and win three in a row to close out the year. I don't know if it. What is the season outlook after that? I think I don't know if that's def- necessarily like a right step, a right direction, but I do think that it saves Tom Allen's job. I agree. Mm-hmm. Which maybe that would be good. Rod Carey has maybe not been the best in moments. Maybe not th- a three-year, $800,000 contract, whatever it is, good. But he's, again, like this entire team, has shown moments of good. So I think if they somehow end up with five wins, I think everyone's job saved. And maybe it is a step in the right direction. Maybe it is a a little notch to get closer mm-hmm. to where yeah because then then you look at it be. from the year before when they went four and eight if they end up five and seven this year you look into the 2024 season obviously with the schedule having to go i forget which one is it at ucla I think, or is it at washington i don't know i think i, washington, I think it's is here it Wa- washington's here and then they're at ucla one year. Late. I don't know. I know. So I'm, whatever it is, but if they find a way with after five and seven season, then you gotta have a little confidence that you can build yeah. from that. Right? I mean, Kylie, to your point of the Rod Carey flashes, I mean, it happened at the right time in the right place at Penn State, number ten team in the nation. This is the time that you need to have the ten. Nine. They're nine now. They wrote. They went up one spot. So I don't know. I think like. This is the time that it needed to happen, and obviously you said at the Monday presser this was the happiest they've all been, so they had to have had to have had a good Sunday going over everything, practice. Things have to be going good, and I think that obviously Lou Moore said that they're just waiting for a bowl game after the game. Now, I think that they're all on the same page right now, and Rod Carey has had enough time with these guys to know what works and what doesn't. And they're probably testing out more stuff now. So I think that this is obviously the best time for something like this to happen. And I think that 
five wins is definitely possible. Six wins is two. But um, anyone want to go through some final score predictions as we close out? <laughs> This might be one of our more We're gonna be, yeah. diverse ones. Yeah. I feel like you and Carlo always stick together, and then, like, if we <laughs> if we go apart, I'm always the one that loses. But <laughs> I, I decide to go with the different factor. But I ahead. think I'm going to take Wisconsin here. I just... I think it's going to be hard for... I think it's going to be hard for Indiana to have another good performance and I think for this game they might need to have a perfect perform not necessarily perfect performance but less mistakes than they have been making if they can learn to stop shooting themselves in the foot then that is definitely good for them but at the end of the day I think it's going to come down to the same old things that we've been seeing just inconsistency just mistakes all around the board I'm gonna say I do think it's gonna be close though I'm gonna say 24 21 Respectfully, this game is going to be a snoozer. It's cold and two not great offenses this year. Wisconsin's offense has been not all that great of what Luke Fickle wants it to be. Obviously, I think in three, four years, this Wisconsin team will be back on the map. But it takes time, especially in football. you got to get through an entire recruiting class before you can see really what a football coach is capable of. It's going to be low scoring. I don't think a team eclipses 20. And I think Indiana walks it off with a Chris Freeman field goal to win 17-16. to 16. Ooh. Okay. Carly, you want to go? Yeah. <clears throat> Looking at the game, I just looked at the spread just to get an idea of what Vegas is thinking. It's a 10-point Wisconsin spread. Mm-hmm. I don't think – I'm going to pick Wisconsin in this game, but I don't think they win by 10 points. And I think it's going to be low scoring. Um, we kind of already talked about Midwest Big Ten football, as you guys are going to clip it. But um, I would say I'm going to go 24-17 Wisconsin. Okay. I am going to go Indiana here. I mean, I explained it before. I think that they picked the right time. or they. It was the first game that they consistently played all four quarters on the offense and the defense. And I think that if they continue to do that, this was the right time to do it. And I think they will. So I'm going to go Indiana. I agree with the low scoring game aspects. I'm going to go Indiana. We're all saying three point differences though. So I did one. You I did. did oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Never mind. So I'm going to go 20 to 17 Indiana. But um, any closing thoughts? Anybody? This game will be huge for a lot yeah, of it's reasons. Make or break. If, yeah. they get, if they get it's, blown out, then it, Mm-hmm. If it gets away early, it's going to be rough. But I don't think it, I think it'll be close throughout. But this game is much bigger than just being belongeable. This is talking mm-hmm. about the people's culture. jobs, yeah. where people are playing next year. This is huge, and this is the first time this season where IU is pretty much their back against the wall. And like, if you don't win this game, and they haven't won since September, if you don't win this game. You're, the season's essentially over. It's mm-hmm. this bit. This game could not be bigger, um, and it'll be it'll be really interesting to see how they respond after a good performance against a, a better Penn State team than Wisconsin. So I mean, it's the game could not be at any higher stakes. So we'll have we'll have to see how Tom Allen gets his team um, ready for this game. Yeah, we talk a lot about on the podcast if they're must win games, and this is the must win game. I feel like so. Um, but yeah, that'll do it here from the studio. Thank you for joining us, Joe. Thanks for hopping on. This was great. Um, yeah, <laughs> I've been your host, Audrey Moore, joined by Kylie Corman and Carla Barone. Make sure to keep up with the Hoosier Network on Instagram, Twitter, Instagram. Oh, I said Instagram. <laughs> TikTok, YouTube, Spotify, and more for all of your IU athletic updates. And we will be at Memorial Stadium on Saturday for all you need to know. So stay tuned, and we will see you next week. Thank you.